Ladies and gentlemen, the, as the President highlighted, the main topics of discussion uh, at this conference, of course, centers around COVID-19. And of course, the world that awaits us, in particular the legal uh, fraternity, post the pandemic. This, of course, is no surprise. And in fact, recently at the AGES conference, we had a number of topics specifically in relation to that. While promising vaccines are slowly rolling out, this pandemic today is deadly and, of course, most economically devastating it has ever been, and its impacts will weigh on us for quite some time. Uh, we gathered down in this room, ladies and gentlemen, very few countries in the world at the moment can do what we are doing currently, and that we are not suffering from a massive outbreak. We aren't meeting virtually. Of course, some people are joining us virtually, but all of you aren't meeting virtually. You're not wearing any masks, nor are you mandated to wear any masks. Our hospitals are not packed with COVID-19 infected patients hooked on ventilators. We are a COVID-contained country and have been for some about 260 days. Unlike other Pacific Island countries, which claim to never have had any community outbreak of the coronavirus, Fiji actually did have an actual outbreak. Despite the initial criticism of seemingly unnecessary stringent measures and a few unfounded legal challenges, we actually contained that outbreak through a decisive national effort. And we have since continued to safely repatriate Fijians from all over the globe without risking public transmission in the, in the community itself. Safe as we may be, however, we still have to reckon with the consequences, as highlighted by the President, of this pandemic. It, of course, has had an impact on private sector, government revenue and contraction of the financial and commercial transactions and consequently, of course, impacted many of you in the private practice. When it comes to obtaining a vaccine, we may well face the same packing order that we are trying to breach with assistance of some of our development partners. Generally, the larger countries with larger pockets obviously get access to vaccines a lot quicker. And there's another topic altogether in respect of that. Even in the best case scenario, anything like the normal we once knew is many, many months away. And whether it's business interruptions, law firm management, or new areas of post-pandemic practice, the legal fraternity must reckon with the new reality and determine whether it fits in the new normal or new norm, how you remodel yourself and run your practice in the post-COVID-19 economy and post-COVID-19 era. I thought as a matter of interest to probably wake you up for the first session, um, there are currently about a thousand uh, valid practicing lawyers in Fiji. If I could have the slide up, uh, up on the screen. 894 to be ex uh, exact. Now, so that's about a thousand, for every thousand Fijians we have one lawyer. Well under the half the rate of lawyers per population in both Australia and New Zealand. Now I've got some detailed breakdown of that. You can see that uh, there's about 137 lawyers in independent institutions, Parliament, Office of DPP, FICAC, Fijian Elections Office, RBF, etc. 71 lawyers in government departments, AG's Chambers, Fiji Police Force, RFMF, a couple of the ministries have lawyers here and there. 71 lawyers in statutory organizations, you know, Consumer Council of Fiji. Uh, various other commissions, LTA, etc. 425 lawyers in private practice, 68 lawyers in corporate organizations like Westpac and the Bank of the South Pacific, etc. What is really interesting though is that we're seeing a lot more lawyers joining corporate organizations. Some um, foreign companies that have set up roading companies in Fiji now have in house lawyers. We have 20 lawyers in NGOs and civil societies, you know, that includes the UN, Women's Crisis Center, CCF, uh, Fiji Rugby Union. We have 101 lawyers out of those 894 that are currently unemployed. 30, 329 lawyers with three years or less post-admission experience. In other words, they cannot be operating their own law firms. Now, out of the private practitioners, there are 135 lawyers as sole principals. In other words, they run their own law firm. They may have other people working for them, but they're not partners. And then we have 26 partnerships, law firms with partners uh, in them. 
So altogether, 161 total number of law firms uh, in Fiji. What is really interesting, we're all talking about, you know, Zoom and all sorts of digital communication. Only 14 law firms in Fiji actually have websites. Only 14 law firms. Out of uh, 161 law firms, uh, we have only 14 law firms. Fiji Law Society membership is about 20% of all the lawyers that are practicing certificates. So one in every five uh, lawyers in Fiji are members of this organization. Now, this is obviously very interesting statistics, and I suggest that the Law Society also looks at it. It's a changing, it's an evolving nature of the legal fraternity in Fiji. Even if you go back 10 or 15 years, you would not have that many people in other types of organizations other than in private practice or probably the AG's office. The largest law firm, as I've said before, is now the Legal Aid Commission. They've over about 100 lawyers, and I'll get back to the point as to why they have that many lawyers. Now, the, the reality of the matter is that as a profession continues to function within the new environment, we each bear responsibility for the direction in which this profession heads with the view that it matures and develops not only to serve ourselves as practitioners, but also the wider community at large. And I think that's critically important. Individual professionals, legal fraternities, law societies, irrespective of size, must take a principal approach to legal development in Fiji, which of course includes the development of new and a maturing jurisprudence. In particular, given the constitutional the constitution we actually have in place, and the ratification of a number of the core international conventions which this, uh, the government has ratified over the past uh, recent times. Because the ratification of these conventions, of course, places an obligation on the state to adhere to those conventions, as the constitution allows. So we should not take a political approach to it, no approach dictated by personalities, but a deeply principled approach to upholding the rule of law and setting reliable precedent that guides legal practitioners now and of course in the future. Part of all of this is to build very strong institutions. I've got a list of all the conventions, I don't really want to go through all of that, but these are the nine core conventions, quite happy to talk to people about that. Uh, in the original program had the uh, uh, you know, reference to the Syracuse principles, and I, I had some notes on that, but again, I mean, it's not there. But you know, essentially, it's the deviation from the ICCPR and what conditions under which you can have those deviations. Uh, the reality of the matter is that those deviations are allowed under ICCPR. And what is really important is that it is really a, a balancing of the rights. People have a right to health, access to health services. People have a right to life. People have a right to economic participation. People have a right to water, housing. Those rights, of course, are socioeconomic rights. The reality in Fiji has been that our discussions on rights fundamentally within the legal fraternity have centered very much around you know, uh, rights, civil and political rights, predominantly. And even that, there's been a limitation to that. For example, things like free speech. However, I think the legal fraternity lacks or has missed the opportunity, but again, the opportunity still exists, to be able to focus on socioeconomic rights. But these are very fundamental rights that many ordinary Fijians, in particular those in the lower socioeconomic brackets, are actually more concerned about. Of course, there's not to negate the civil political rights itself, but there's a lot more focus in those areas. Now, um, I, I, I don't want to be actually uh, uh, too long, but recently we've had discussions, and I'd like to thank uh, the President of the Fiji Law Society in coming and having a meeting with us. We've had a couple of meetings so far. We've discussed a number of issues. But I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, by making some of these comments, I can sort of, you know, eke out some discussions that you may have over the next two days. One of the uh, challenges now with the legal fraternity is, as the Law Society talked about, a mooted is the idea of increasing the period for which a person actually can become a sole practitioner. So at the moment it's three years. So there's a discussion about increasing it to five years. 
um, you know, given apparently the, the, the quality of lawyers. And we do agree that in some instances, as we've seen ourselves, that there is perhaps a lack of, you know, a more nuanced approach to the law, to put it uh, diplomatically, in terms of the skill sets that exist. But perhaps the, the reason why that is happening is because there's a lack of mentoring of young practitioners. I know 10, 15 years ago, if you had a, a, a junior in your firm, the amount of time you spent in mentoring that person was a lot more. Uh, today, it is far less. And frankly, at the moment, I mean, we did a recent survey. There are junior lawyers being paid $150 a week in some of the law firms. By comparison, if you join the uh, AG's office, if you work in some of the other uh, statutory organizations, your starting salary is over $30,000. I think it's about $32,000. One can, of course, argue that when you're in the private sector, after five or seven or maybe 10 years, your level of income may surpass that of somebody in government. But the reality at the moment is that for the first at least five years, the, the revenue or the salaries for those in private practice is far less than those who are actually working for government-related or statute-related organizations, or indeed even in the private sector working as corporate lawyers. So the, you know, we, we have to be able to be, you know, talk about these things reasonably in a very critical manner to look at the quality of practitioners and how actually we can assist those practitioners to become better lawyers. And I think that's critically important. It does not necessarily mean by increasing the period of, you know, uh, uh, from three to five, you somehow or the other suddenly within those two years get better lawyers. I think it's about time that we're able to focus more in respect of, you know, of management, in respect of training. Every year, as a, by, by way of reference, I get at least about 40% of lawyers in private practice asking for extensions of time on the trust account audits being filed. I just did seven last night before coming here. Extensions of time. Some people get three extensions. So we've now made a policy that once we give two extensions, we don't give any more extensions after that. These are the type of you know, mentoring, the training perhaps, and you know, we don't necessarily blame them. But perhaps that level of exposure, people may be going too early into private practice on their own. And the fact that you have only 14 websites actually means there's a lack of specialization in Fiji. And I've said this before when the former president invited me to one of your conventions uh, at the Fiji a, a few years ago. There's only you know, a handful of lawyers in Fiji who are able to actually attract international work. The question should be asked, why aren't the other lawyers in private practice able to attract international work? Why aren't the other lawyers able to specialize in different areas? 95% of Fijians today have a mobile phone, which means they all have internet connectivity. That means they can actually access your law firms through your website. But only 14 law firms have websites. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, of course, you know, you, you have a session on, you know, business interrupted issues arising from COVID-19, uh, exploring new areas of practice. And I really don't want to go into too much detail on that, but I think one of the issues that we did highlight that in, in, in the AG's conference, there are so many new areas of law that's developing, and I'm afraid many lawyers aren't up to speed with it because they don't necessarily see it as traditional legal practice. One of them is climate change. Uh, we've got a climate change bill coming into play uh, very soon. And just to you know, get some of you excited, because I know you all love conveyancing, is the carbon markets. Carbon markets is big business. And Fiji is ripe for carbon market trading. In the climate change bill, there's actually a provision regarding carbon markets. How many actually know about it? How many have actually read, read the bill? There's been uh, public submissions, still out for public submissions. We're doing a second round of redrafting of the climate change bill. You know, you, for those of you who may not necessarily know, you're able to register under the Register of Carbon Sequestration Property Rights under the Climate Change Bill, or the Act hopefully will become an Act soon. 
Once it's registered, you actually create instruments of title and register with the Registrar of Titles. You can actually transfer those property rights. It will also be recognized under the Personal Property Securities Act. How many have actually thought about positioning yourself perhaps to you know, represent landowners? There are many landowners who have actually large areas of land that is in, under virgin forest. They don't necessarily have to make money by cutting down those trees, but actually can make a lot more money by keeping those trees in the ground. So these are the rights that are existing. They are property rights. These are new opportunities for practice. Now, there's also, for example, uh, you know, we, we, we are going to do a lot of work in that area. I please urge you to, to look at carbon trading. There's also the blue carbon market. A lot of people generally think of you know, carbon trading only relating to sort of terrestrial trees on, on ground, on the land. But mangroves, sea grasses, we are currently looking at issuing a blue carbon bond. We're working with the, with the Brits on this. And again, there's, we're looking at you know, secondary market trading of our bonds. We've never had secondary market trading. People like William Parkinson may buy bonds and keep that in his drawer until it matures. But the reality of the matter is now, by, by this year or so sometime, we'll be doing secondary market trading. How many of you actually know about that? I'm not saying all of you suddenly need to become experts on carbon trading or secondary market trading, but I'm just trying to highlight to you these are some of the new areas of practice. Um, intellectual property. Again, as you know, that uh, we recently uh, you know, have ratified a number of conventions, including the Madrid system. Our Trademarks Act goes to 1933. That's how old it is. Patent Act goes back to 1879. Designs Act goes back to 1937. We've got three bills currently tabled before Parliament. Please, law society, individual lawyers, you can go and make submissions on that. We've already ratified the international conventions. Now, I know some of the lawyers had actually objected, a couple of law firms had objected to the fact that we wanted to get in with to the Madrid system, which now allows people to essentially register their trademarks by sitting in their home countries. They don't have to use law firms in Fiji. And some law firms objected to that, saying there'll be a loss of revenue. But we need to look at the big picture. We need to look at the big picture in the sense that by making yourself a lot more user-friendly or uh, complying with ease of doing business, you'll be able to attract a lot more investment. And therefore, it gives work or generates work for law firms uh, in, in Fiji. I think, you know, sometimes change may be difficult to handle. In the same way, when we introduced the ACC, ACCF, a number of the law firms and indeed some insurance companies objected to it, notwithstanding the fact that we have a similar setup in New Zealand Notwithstanding the fact that now, again I go back to those Fiji in the lower socioeconomic backgrounds, are able to get compensation without getting or having to engage lawyers, without waiting for 10 years, 7 years to get compensation. This is true justice at work. And I think it is critically important for us to be able to understand that. The, um, you know, there's also, with the, with the designs, we, we have already highlighted that we'll be introducing uh, some laws uh, regarding uh, traditional knowledge, uh, intellectual property relating to indigenous knowledge. Uh, how many of you have actually read up on that? Designs is critically important. The reality of the matter is, legally speaking, uh, one particular company is currently claiming that they own the word Fiji that no other, no other company with a trademark with the word Fiji in it can actually operate in USA. That's the dilemma we are in, because there's been lack of foresight in respect of how we actually implemented our trademark registration. And of course, as a small country, the word Fiji, which actually has an enormous brand value and conjures our very positive images, should be something that we, as a country, need to have intellectual property rights over. 
Um, I was very interested in um, the topic walking the tightrope. Just because it's legal, does it make it right? It kind of reminded me of some of the philosophy, uh, philosophy uh, lectures we had at you know at university, and uh, you know there's a deontological ethics as opposed to uh, consequentialism. Deontological, one of the most famous deontological slogan is, "Let justice be done, though the heavens fall." Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. So essentially, it put simply, it means that the morality of an action should be based on whether the action itself is right or wrong. So if the law is there, then therefore it is right, irrespective of the consequences. The law is deemed to be right, and therefore it is right. Of course, we can go into history. Apartheid was legalized. Apartheid was the law. People had to follow it. Was it right? Was it just? The Girmit system was put in legal form. Was it right? People are being beaten up as slaves. Indigenous Fijians in Fiji could not go to um, you know, uh, municipalities without a permit. They had to go and stay in Rainbow or Walum Bay if you wanted to go to Suva and get a permit for the day. Was it right? But it was the law. Women could not have uh, property rights only about 120 or 30 years ago in Europe. It was the law. But was it right? Of course, that subjectivity transcends even in legal decisions. High Court decision in 2001 on the dismissal of the then Prime Minister could be classed as neither legal nor right. The High Court ruled that his removal was legal. Of course, subsequently the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court held that it was incorrect, but of course time had already passed. And the consequences of those decisions were already implemented. Slavery. See what's happening in USA currently. Many would argue what's happening in USA is because the inability of the American state to be able to deal with the horrors of the past. Slavery, where people were actually put on display and people were sold and bought and people were killed if they escaped, was actually legal. He had rights over human beings, property rights. So. I'd be very interested, I want to sit in that session because, you know, obviously you can argue sometimes things that may be right actually aren't legal. On the other hand, something may be the law, but is it just? I think justice is actually a lot more, and indeed substantive justice is far more critical. Climate change, is it moral? Certain states are currently allowing their companies to emit carbon into the air and we are paying the consequences. I was in uh, Vanuatu, as I said earlier on. Uh, people's homes have been ripped out from their foundations. The intensity, the frequency of these storms are, is enormous. 43 villages have to be moved to higher ground, no fault of their own. Is it moral? But it's legal in those states to actually emit that type of carbon into the air. Um, I think, you know, um, the issues pertaining to insurance, and I don't know what, for example, Wayne Wong and them will be talking about, but we've had you know, most definitely some challenges in, in, in respect of that, where, we, you know, recently I received a call from um, uh, a hotel worker, given that we're a hotel, uh, they had group insurance, um, medical insurance, and said, look, you know, uh, we are unemployed now, we cannot pay uh, the insurance premium and our, premium, uh, sorry, our policy has lapsed, can you ask the insurance company to say to put our premium on hold? But if you put the premium on hold and the insurance has lapsed, does not mean nobody will get sick. In the same way, if you group insurance for life insurance, does not mean because you put it on a, on a hold that nobody will die. So what are the legal ramifications or implications of that? These are complex issues. And I think at the end of the day, many of these things depend on the provider of the policy. But you know, I, again, I think uh, uh, insurance remains a very critical issue, and I, and I hope that you'll be able to talk about some of those, uh, those issues. Fiji has ratified the New York uh, Convention on Arbitration and Singapore Convention Mediation. We are obligated to enforce arbitral awards and settlement agreements reached with the mechanisms provided under the conventions. So in order to meet this obligation, we enacted the International Arbitration Act 2017 and indeed amended our High Court rules to provide for the domestic enforcement of international arbitral law, uh, awards. 
We are also currently drafting our international mediation bill in order to give effect to the Singapore Convention and are in the process of setting up the Pacific International Mediation Arbitration Center in Nandi here, which will make Fiji a hub for cross-border dispute resolution in the Pacific region. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, contracts uh, being uh, awarded, in particular to the Pacific Island countries. Most of these uh, clauses in some of these uh, contracts actually have Singapore as a point of arbitration. We are currently working with the Singapore, Singaporean, sorry, to be able to set up a, a similar system in Fiji. And again, I urge those of you who may be very litigious-minded to please look at arbitration, look at mediation. We have the Fiji, Fiji Mediation Center. Again, in this post-pandemic environment, many businesses don't necessarily have the pocket don't necessarily have the, the, the energy to be able to, or wanting to fight long, drawn out legal battles. People want settlements quickly, people want arbitrations quickly. How many of you are geared or engineered towards that? You can still make money if that's the driving factor, but the ability to be able to be responsive as a professional to your clients, I think, is critically important. I think, you know, uh, lawyer well-being, of course, uh, is there, and which is great. But I think uh, one of the ways of increasing your well-being and giving you some form of psychological um, stress-free environment is by doing some community work. I have to say this, and, and we've had discussions in the past, I think the Law Society members actually have um, not taken up the opportunity that was an offer. Firstly, with the Legal Aid Commission. Six million dollars worth of legal work that could have been outsourced was not really up, taken up by private practitioners. Six million dollars worth. And I know some of you have been struggling with your practices. Only 300,000 dollars worth of legal work was actually farmed out. As a result of that, as a result of that, the, law, the Legal Aid Commission now is setting up different offices within its own system to avoid conflict. And I think it's an opportunity that actually has been missed and I hope uh, that the President of Law Society can approach the Chair of the Legal Aid Commission and perhaps to open up the door. It is good work. There's also been a lot of reports that those who did do some of the work actually making, you know, claims that weren't necessarily legitimate. But I can tell you there's a lot of work being generated because the Legal Aid Commission does not only do family law matters, it also does civil work also. That's one opportunity. The other one is the first hour procedure. Uh, the former president, together with one of the council members, uh, went to Geneva and uh, maybe a couple other places, I'm not sure, to UK. Uh, but to date, uh, none of the private practitioners actually have engaged in the first hour procedure. Legal aid is doing that, including people who have been arrested because of breaches of curfew. Including them. And they do provide uh, support to them. So I, I would again urge you to, to, to look at those aspects. And in fact, there's, I've been told that there's one particular practitioner in the Western Division who actually apparently was a former staff of the Legal Aid Commission who is doing really quite well out of this. Many more, many more of you can actually do that, and I urge you to do that. You know, personally speaking, <clears throat> to be able to provide a particular level of service and to empower people, sometimes it may be a very small thing, is actually quite satisfying. It is really deeply satisfying. Uh, and there's a lot of work out there. First hour procedure, we'd love to have you on board. You can do a roster with the Legal Aid Commission. The fact that you don't have that many calls, you may get one call maybe every six months, <coughs> if that, depending on what rotation you are, which city or town you're in. So these, those are the kind of opportunities, and I don't want to go into the, uh, the, the, the details, but the Legal Aid Commission has set up what we call a conflict unit, and I understand the, the Honorable Chief Justice has actually allowed or given some practice direction where in certain matters specifically they are able to represent both parties as long as there is a, you know, a conflict unit that has been established. 
ladies and gentlemen, the, um, of course, uh, I was very interested lastly in the topic free speech or censorship, lawyers and social media. Um, very interesting topic. I think some of the most vocal people on social media in Fiji are actually lawyers. Um, so I don't know where, where the censorship aspect of that comes into it. But what is really interesting in the past 12 hours is that Donald Trump was suspended from Twitter for 12 hours, I think. And Facebook, I was told this morning, has suspended or banned him for the next two weeks. What is really an interesting question is, similar comments made by personalities outside of the USA, Facebook and Twitter probably won't take the same action. It is because it is homegrown, and therefore the focus is there. So again, you need to look at the nuances of actually how, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, and the other uh, social media platforms are actually able to deal with these kind of issues. And these are these are actually not, you know, uh, easy calls to make. The reality is, if Twitter has banned or suspended him for 12 hours, suspended him for two weeks, will they apply the same rationale and the same principles? to people in other jurisdictions? It's a question that needs to be asked and indeed must be answered. Where does, for example, and I think again, uh, the courts in Fiji, with due respect, has missed out on a couple of the cases that have come before the courts in respect of uh, whether it's defamation or whether it's in respect of, of slander, etc., but in particular defamation, missed out a great opportunity in developing the jurisprudence pertaining to that. And the balancing of those rights. Gul is shaking head because she knows one case in particular. And I think there is the miss, absolutely missed opportunity. It is very, what I may call respect, a rudimentary judgment. It went in the favor of the plaintiffs, of course, but would have been nice if the jurisprudence was actually developed. I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we were obviously concerned about this, but uh, the, and therefore we developed the Online Safety Commission. Fundamentally, if you look at the Online Safety Commission Act, it is there to protect uh, children uh, and women. We've had cases where, and I've mentioned this uh, previously, uh, one particular case which led to this sort of act being put in place or the bill being drafted, there's a young lady, I think she was in 18 or, or 20, where somebody put a camera in her bedroom and um, there's live feed. So you take off your clothes in your room, you do things in your room, it was all being live fed. And the bloke was actually selling this. He was a bloke and he was selling this online. The psychological and the emotional impact on that lady was phenomenal. So we have had a number of such cases, and this is why the Online Safety Commission was actually put in place. And, and I hope the, you know, the, the Commission uh, is actually doing a lot more work in, in, in that respect. Of course, there are some Twitter obsessive lawyers uh, who actually uh, every day uh, make comments, uh, and they post, of course, whatever is on top of their mind at that particular point in time. But we know they certainly don't face any serious problems expressing themselves, nor should they. The question, of course, I then go back to is what Twitter and Facebook has done in the past 12 hours. If somebody were to post those kind of comments in Fiji, would they take those kind of actions? Government, most certainly, I can tell you, does not have the resources to be monitoring those kind of tweets or, or you know, posts, nor do we have the capacity to be able to stop them. We just don't have the ability to do so. But one would hope, getting back to your topic, is it legal, but is it right, would prevail. What is just, what is fair, what is right would actually prevail in the sense of a principal approach would actually uh, uh, prevail over overwhelmingly. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I think I've, I've talked uh, enough about uh, some of the issues that I think that you could probably uh, discuss and be able to highlight. One area that is actually my, my, my pet topic, and I'd like to actually highlight that again, is I, I really would like to see the development of jurisprudence pertaining to socioeconomic rights in Fiji. It is a plethora of rights in the Constitution. I have not seen any, any substantive matter being brought before the courts in respect of socioeconomic rights in Fiji. None whatsoever. 
there's one or two that were sort of struck off because they got it wrong, even before we had a trial. And you are the people who can do that. As you can see, bulk of the lawyers are with government, independent organizations, statutory bodies, and as a private practice actually can you know, fulfill those rights or actually develop the jurisprudence in that area. I'd like to thank uh, the President of the Law Society uh, for the invitation. I look forward to working with all of you. I also look forward to spending the next couple of days uh, in between uh, with your convention. I wish you all the best. Thank you.